as it is New Year's Day, not just the day after New Year's, but New Year's Day itself, churches all across America are talking about their vision statements and their vision for the year 2023 and what they are going to do as far as reaching their community. And some of them have gone so far as to say, well, this is what, uh, you know, God has told me for the church to do for this year. Some have uh, had all kinds of prophetic visions of what they're going to do in the new year. Well, we also have a mission, and it's even a divine one given by God through special revelation that I'm going to give you this morning. And no, it wasn't from an angel that visited me. It wasn't through some kind of vision. It wasn't through a dream. The only angel I saw last night was Clarence the angel, and it's a wonderful life. Where we get our divine mandate is through Jesus Christ himself in Matthew chapter number 28. A very familiar passage known as the Great Commission. This is the mission of the church. In fact, this isn't unique to Reformation Church. This is and ought to be the mission of every single church on the planet. More than that, we have no authority to have any other mission than this mission. We don't have the ability to just come up with some newfangled idea, to, to wander off into some other objective or goal other than what our risen Lord has told us as his church to do. Now, different churches may express this in different ways. We try to encapsulate this down to two simple words, reforming lives, because we believe it encapsulates the Great Commission. But make no mistake about it, the Great Commission itself is the authority by which we even function at all as a church. So, turn to Matthew chapter number 28, starting, um, let's start in verse 16, actually. This is after the resurrection. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Isn't that interesting? They've just seen all these prophecies come through. They've seen the, the crucifixion of Jesus. They've seen the resurrection of Jesus. And now they're waiting for him and the resurrected Lord to come to them. And they worshipped, but even in their worship, some still had doubts. They still had uncertainty. The Bible is remarkably frank and bold about the internal struggles that they go through. And you this morning may be worshipping with some doubts mixed in. Well, you're in good company, for the apostles themselves had this same doubt and worship mixed in. And it continues, and Jesus came and said to them, usually when we talk about the Great Commission, we think, okay, well, it's, well, it's go, go therefore. No, the Great Commission doesn't start with go. The Great Commission starts with all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is our mission, church. And this mission wasn't crafted or formed based off sociology reports or customer satisfaction surveys or any kind of demographic research that we've done. This mission is a divine mission given by God. Reforming lives, what does this mean? Well, encapsulated in the Matthew 28, it's to make genuine Christian disciples through the gospel who worship, learn about, and serve God. The church, you see, should be a disciple-making machine. Now, we have been in this particular building for about three years. And it is time, church, that we lean even more into our mission. Now, we've done that some here. We have our trail life ministry that has been out in the community through parades and through Christmas tree lightings and various public service uh, projects. We have our missionary flights international that we fund we, through uh, my chaplaincy connections. We've been able to spread the name of Reformation Church and the gospel that way. We have our track table in the back that we can send things out with. We have a food box ministry, the pregnancy care center, uh, evangelism training that we did through Wednesdays, and new resources that are even going to come in the new year of, of, of some more videos and podcasts and that sort of thing to help equip you better. But even more than that, church, we all need to lean into this Great Commission even more in the new year, and that requires all of us. Not just some, 
Notice, this was given to all the church at the time. All the disciples were assembled. Now, of course, they were all apostles, but this isn't just a task for pastors. This is a task of the entire church of God. So, what does it mean? All authority on heaven and earth. How much authority? All. Every bit of it. Not just one day to come. Not just in the new heaven and the new earth has all authority in heaven and on earth been given to him. Right now, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. Now, authority, exousia, this power, this, this active ability, this jurisdictional reign over things means this. It's not just that Jesus has the power to do whatever he wants. He does. He has the proper jurisdiction to also do so. That he has reigned and risen from the dead and he has power over death, hell, the grave, all the universe is at his command. Colossians 2, 9 through 10 says, um, uh, it's, uh, uh, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. He has all rule in himself. He keeps this whole universe existing by the power of his might. He has active power, the full ability to do as he wills to do. This is prophesied again in Daniel 7, which I won't read, about all authority and everlasting dominion being given to the Messiah. What does this mean? This means if he has all authority in heaven and earth, and this is what he told us to do, one, we have No right or ability to refuse it. And two, it means the Great Commission will succeed. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. It will come to the fruition of what he intended it to do. This command that he gives his church, it will come to completion. He's the one that will establish it. The question is not, will the Great Commission succeed? Because I'm not going to lay all of the evangelism of the entire planet onto your shoulders. I've been guilt-tripped enough through uh, various years in church about having the whole world on my shoulders. Christ himself has all rule and authority. The question is not, will the Great Commission succeed because of you? The question is, are you going to be part of that success or not? Are you going to join in the mission of God? So oftentimes we talk about uh, salvation as as accepting Jesus into our life. The better question is, is our life going to be in Christ's life instead? Are we going to give our life to his mission and goals and dreams and purposes? The Great Commission will succeed. Will you be part of it? Or will you be like the unfaithful servant on the sidelines who buries his talent in the sand and in the dirt? So... This command, this command of spreading the gospel was not just individual, but it was communal as well to the entire church. It takes all of us together, neatly fitted with all of our unique giftings and personalities and talents and abilities to carry out this great commission. We do this together. Matthew 24, 14 refers to this as the gospel of the kingdom. The message of God and the gospel is inseparable from the rulership of Jesus Christ over all things. Therefore, it says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore. Therefore denotes this mediatorial authority given from Christ to the church. All authority has been given to me. Therefore, I tell you, the church of Jesus Christ has complete and utter authority from the ruler of the universe to carry out the Great Commission. We don't have to ask permission from anybody. We don't have to petition our governor to do it. We don't have to ask city officials if we're going to do it or not. I don't ha- you, you don't have to ask your, jo- your boss or anyone that's over you in authority if you're going to fulfill this Great Commission. The church has been given complete authority from the King of Kings and Lord of Lords to do this. It's our task, church. We have authority to do so. Now, sometimes we get confused with the language here. It says, go therefore, and people say, well, what is the chief command in uh, the Great Commission? And they say, well, go. Well, that's not one. Grammatically, it's not technically a command. It's a subparticiple. But besides that, you can go, 
and not fulfill anything. I can go to the store. I can, unfortunately, yesterday I went to Walmart, and I hate going to Walmart. You can go many different places, but go itself doesn't mean anything. No, what the actual direct, the only imperative command in this passage, actually, is make disciples. That is the goal of the Great Commission. Not just converts, not just people that walked an aisle, not just people that said, yeah, I'm going to you know, dedicate my life and then go run off into the world. Making disciples is the role of the church, and therefore the church ought to be a disciple-making machine. Now we as a church, I think we do good at some aspects of discipleship. We do good at the, the theological training side and the maturing side and the growth side, but this initial phase, the come to Christ and salvation phase, that church, Reformation Church, we need to focus and lean into even more in this new year. So, what are these other sub-commands? The go, the baptize, the teach. These are all participles connected to the main command. So, how do you make disciples? Well, this is how. You go, you baptize, and you teach. And so these are all under the subheading of making disciples, which is the Great Commission. It's a list and a process. So what is a disciple? It's one who submits to a teacher. We make ourselves disciples of Christ. Not for ourselves. Not the famous teachers. Not to Pastor Skip and I. Not to rabbis who would then form disciples for themselves. Rather, we make disciples of Jesus Christ. And where is the range and scope of this? He says, make disciples of all nations. Not just a Jewish sect, not just an ethnic group. Every single nation on this planet is subject to the jurisdiction of the Great Commission. What Christ calls for in this passage is the spiritual conquest of the entire earth. And he uses us to do it. This is ethnos, this nations, every ethnic group, every language, culture, not just one particular subgroup, everyone on the planet. Now, we have to admit, not every Christian is an evangelist. There is actually a gifting for evangelism. And we cannot all fit the same mold, and that is not what we want to try to do. We want to elicit all of your gifts as they uniquely are given to you by the Spirit, but all must follow 1 Peter 3.15, which says this, But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Not all may stand on a stage, not all may have all kinds of conferences that they speak at, but all must be able to tell others about the hope that you have in Jesus. The question is, do you have that hope in Jesus? If you don't have that hope in Jesus, you can't possibly uh, transmit it to others. But if your hope, if your faith, if your trust is in Jesus Christ, be ready to share that with others. So what is this gospel that we are to share? In fact, it says that in Mark 16, a parallel passage, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. So what is this gospel? Well, Paul tells us very plainly in 1 Corinthians 15. Now, I remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preach to you, which you received and which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I received. So here it is. Here's the gospel. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the gospel. Our response to the gospel is believing and trusting in faith, but our response isn't this gospel itself. This means that if you tell someone that Jesus Christ died for our sins, he was buried, and three days later he rose again, their response ought to be faith and trust in him, but if you've told them that, you've evangelized that person. You may not have led them in a sinner's prayer. You may not have had some kind of conversion experience with them. But if you've told them the gospel, that is evangelizing. That's what the word evangelism even means. It's a gospelization. You've told them the gospel. And this is what we must do as Christians. 
Romans 10, 9, a passage that every Christian should have burned in their memories. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Sometimes we doubt our salvation. You know, am I really saved? Well, do you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead? Well, the Bible says then you are saved. And this is the message we also proclaim and preach to all those that are lost and dying in this world. Spurgeon said this, uh, What if he dies, the lost sinner, before you have cleared your conscience of him? Oh, my brothers and sisters, if sinners will be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. And if they will perish, let them perish with our arms about their knees, imploring them to stay and not madly to destroy themselves. If hell must be filled, at least let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions, and let not one go there unwarned and unprayed for. We, church, we need to grow up. We need to realize that authority has been given to us to preach the gospel to all those who are around us to our friends, our co-workers, our neighbors, those we meet in the street and in the grocery stores. We must share this gospel because this, this going, really the term for that is as you are going, where you're at, the place that God has put you in your, in your jobs, in your homes, in your families, of where you live, that is the very going that he's talking about, wherever God has sent you. And he's sent you to this exotic land of Plant City, Florida, or some from the Zephyr Hills and other places. God has put you there for a reason, and it's for a great commission reason. And then we are to baptize, just as baptism is perpetual throughout time until the return of Christ, so the Great Commission as well is perpetual. It keeps on going until his return. What is baptism? What's well, baptism in the name, the singular name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? It is not baptizing in a person's name. Just as Pastor Skip read, it is not baptizing in the name of Paul or Cephas or anybody else. But in the divine name and repentance to God, discipleship begins with baptism. You may be saved, you may be a true believer, but the road to discipleship starts with baptism. And if you have said you are a believer and you've been a believer for ages and ages and years and years and you haven't been baptized, you're not officially a disciple yet. The road, the beginning of discipleship begins with baptism, which later this month we'll have a baptism if anyone needs to do so. It's in the Trinitarian formula, which is interesting, because usually we think of the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity, as some esoteric, advanced theological concept. Jesus himself says, no, the beginning of discipleship starts with the Trinity. This is the beginning of it. Whenever you're baptized, we invoke this name of the Trinity. Baptism itself is intricately associated to our salvation, not that it saves us, but that's a picture of what Christ has done for us. Calvin says this, Christ enjoins that those who have submitted to the gospel and profess to be his disciples shall be baptized, partly that their baptism may be a pledge of eternal life before God and partly that it may be an outward sign of faith before men. For we know that God testifies to us the grace of adoption by this sign because he engrafts us into the body of his Son so as to reckon us among his flock. Therefore, not only our spiritual washing, by which he reconciles us to himself, but likewise our new righteousness are represented by it. So, make disciples. How you do that? You go, you baptize. Lastly, you teach. How much do we teach? Well, all things I have commanded you. It's a holistic teaching. We know that 2 Timothy 3.16 says all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training and righteousness. All of the Bible is what we are to teach. This means that until you have completely mastered everything in here, both in content and in the way you live, you're not done being a disciple yet. Discipleship is a lifelong process. 
it will not be completed until Jesus Christ actually returns for us, or we die and then we are in his presence. But until then, we are disciples as we make other disciples. Notice, verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. You are to follow these very things you are teaching to other people. It's not a hypocrisy of just trying to make other people do something that we ourselves aren't willing to live based on. This shows up in many ways. In fact, even your family is a ministry. If you are teaching them to observe the things that Christ has taught. This can go as surface or as deep as the Bible itself. Notice the directional language. Teach them all I have commanded you, the disciples, others. We must ourselves be obedient. Paul himself said, if, if you teach others not to steal, do you yourself steal? Our failure to teach all things, not just the basics of the faith, all things, means that even if we have evangelized the entire world, we have failed the Great Commission. We must be teachers in all things to grow up into maturity. But this Great Commission isn't just accomplished by ourselves. It's easy to think, oh, all authority in heaven and earth has begun to me, therefore go do these things, and then you're on your own. And Christ just expects you to do it all. Rather, he gives us a promise attached to the Great Commission. I will be with you. Some things say, and lo, or and behold, meaning pay attention to this. Always, every single day, I am with you. The connection of Christ being with you is connected to the Great Commission. Because if you're on his mission, he has this divine promise that he will be with you. <coughs> if you go off on your own mission, well, there's, there's no promise there. But if you are following after Christ, you are not in this alone. He's with you till the end of the age, meaning until heaven and earth and everything we see is burnt up into dust, he will be with you. No matter what comes your way, no matter what sickness, death, tragedy... Christ be, will be with you. And as we mentioned before, he will succeed. Revelation 7, chapter number, or Revelation 7, verse number 9. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne of God and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. God, Christ, will bring to completion his great commission. Will you join him? Will you join him in 2023? So, what does this mean for you? Go to that next slide and then we'll close. You may have seen this before, this cycle of reformation. It begins with worship. That's how you go. Prayer itself, saying, Lord, save me, is an act of worship. And from worship, it should learn to you learning about who God is and what he's like. And from that learning, it doesn't just stay in head knowledge. It ought to lead to service unto God by using the gifts, talents, resources that God has given you. And then that ought to lead into greater worship of God. And this cycle continues Worship, learn, and serve throughout the entire Christian life. Each one supporting and nourishing each other. Notice here, this also comes from the Great Commission. The worship, all authority is given to him, which is worthy of worship. Baptize in the name, that is also worship. And then the go wherever you are. The learning, it says very clearly, teaching them all things I have commanded you, and then serving them, it says to observe all that I have commanded you. Put these things into action. Worship and serving and learning are essential to the Christian life. This is what it means to be a reformer. You know, at the end of each service, we say, Lord, send us out as reformers into this world. This is what it means that we are people who worship, learn, and serve. We need to do all three of those in this new year. In fact, I would say, and this is such a low bar, if it sounds high to you, <laughs> there should be three hours minimum a week, one hour of worshiping, one hour of serving, one hour of learning in your week as a Christian, just to have the bare minimum, if even that, of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. What you're doing here, you're worshiping. 
If you came for coffee talk, you spend an hour learning. If you stay and take down the Christmas decorations, you served. This is such a, a low bar, but essential for each of us that we find in our week a priority to worship, learn, and serve because that means we are disciples of Jesus. And we can't have one without the other. Sometimes we say, well, I'm more of a learning kind of guy, so I'm going to ignore the other. No, no, no. All three of these must be present in the Christian's life. All three of these support each other. Worship and serving without learning is merely sentimentalism. Learning and serving without worship is just activism. And worshiping and learning without serving is just isolationism. We need all three of these things together. And this applies not just to adults, this applies to all of my children and everyone who calls upon the name of Jesus to be a reformer. So, church, we have been given by God a mission from him. Let us make sure that in 2023 we are faithful in carrying out this great commission because he will be with us always, even to the end of the age. And in that end of the age, we look forward to in the Lord's Supper that proclaims his death until he comes. So at this time, Pastor Skip is going to come and lead us in a time of reflection and invitation based on the message.